Hi everyone, welcome to the Investing Iguana, where I share with you the best tips and tricks on how to grow your wealth and achieve financial freedom. I'm Iggy, your host and guide on this journey. Today, we're going to talk about a very important topic, the psychology of money. What is the psychology of money? Well, it's the study of how our emotions, beliefs, and biases affect our financial decisions and outcomes. It's not about how smart you are or how much you know about math or economics. It's about how you behave with money and what drives your choices. Why is this important? Because money is not just a number or a tool. It's a reflection of who we are, what we value, and what we want in life. And sometimes, we don't even realize how our money habits are influenced by our past experiences, our social environment, and our personality. In this video, I'm going to share with you some of the most fascinating and useful insights from a book that changed my life and how I think about money. It's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, and it's a collection of 19 stories that illustrate different aspects of human behavior related to money. I highly recommend you to read this book if you want to learn more about the psychology of money and improve your financial well-being. But for now, let me give you a summary of some of the key takeaways from this book that you can apply to your own life right away. Let's get started. Alright, the first takeaway from the book is that no one's crazy. What does that mean? It means that people have different views and preferences about money based on their own experiences and circumstances. What makes sense to you might seem irrational to someone else, and vice versa. For example, some people might save a lot of money and live frugally, even if they have a high income. Others might spend lavishly and enjoy life in the present, even if they have a low income. Some people might invest aggressively and take big risks, while others might prefer safety and stability. There's no right or wrong way to deal with money, as long as you're aware of the trade-offs and consequences of your choices. The book tells the story of Ronald Ridd, a janitor who died with $8 million in his bank account, and Richard Fuscone, a former Wall Street executive who went bankrupt in the 2008 financial crisis. Both of them had different goals and strategies with money, and both of them faced different outcomes. The lesson here is that you shouldn't judge or copy other people's money decisions without understanding their context and motivations. You should also be open-minded and respectful of other people's perspectives, even if they differ from yours. And most importantly, you should figure out what works best for you and your situation and stick to it. That's the only way to be happy and successful with money. Okay, the second takeaway from the book is that luck and risk are both real and hard to identify. What does that mean? It means that sometimes, our financial outcomes are influenced by factors that are beyond our control and hard to predict. Sometimes, we get lucky and benefit from a positive event or opportunity that we didn't expect or deserve. Other times, we get unlucky and suffer from a negative event or threat that we didn't anticipate or avoid. For example, some people might inherit a fortune from their relatives or win the lottery. Others might lose their job or their health due to a pandemic or a natural disaster. Some people might invest in a company that becomes a huge success or a market that booms. Others might invest in a company that goes bankrupt or a market that crashes. The problem is that we often confuse luck and risk with skill and strategy. We tend to attribute our success to our own abilities and efforts and our failure to external forces and circumstances. We also tend to underestimate the role of luck and risk in other people's outcomes and judge them based on their results rather than their actions. The lesson here is that you should be humble and realistic about your financial achievements and setbacks. You should acknowledge the role of luck and risk in your life and not take them for granted or ignore them. You should also be careful and cautious about your financial decisions and not rely on luck or avoid risk. You should always have a plan and a margin of error and be prepared for the unexpected. Alright, the third takeaway from the book is that there's never enough. What does that mean? It means that human nature is such that we always want more than what we have, and we're never satisfied with what we achieve. We always compare ourselves to others who have more or better than us, and we feel envious or inferior. We also adjust our expectations and desires to our current situation, and we take for granted what we already have. For example, some people might think that they'll be happy if they earn a certain amount of money or reach a certain level of wealth. But once they get there, they realize that they still want more, or they find new things to spend on or worry about. Others might think that they'll be content if they have the same or better than their peers or neighbors. 
but once they catch up or surpass them, they find new people to compare themselves to, or they feel insecure or threatened. The problem is that this endless pursuit of more and better can lead to unhappiness and stress. It can also lead to greed and arrogance, which can make us take unnecessary risks or make unethical choices. It can also make us lose sight of what really matters in life, such as our health, our relationships, and our happiness. The lesson here is that you should be grateful and appreciative of what you have, and not take it for granted or waste it. You should also be mindful and intentional about what you want, and not let it be influenced by others or by your emotions. You should also have a clear and realistic definition of what enough means for you, and stick to it. You should also remember that money is not the only or the most important thing in life, and that there are other sources of value and joy. Okay, the fourth takeaway from the book is that compounding is amazing and powerful. What does that mean? It means that small and consistent actions or decisions can lead to huge and exponential results over time. It also means that time is the most valuable asset we have, and that we should use it wisely and effectively. For example, some people might think that saving or investing a small amount of money every month or year is not worth it, or that it won't make a difference. But if they do it for a long period of time, say 10, 20, or 30 years, they can end up with a large sum of money, thanks to the magic of compounding interest. Others might think that learning or improving a skill or a habit every day or week is not important, or that it won't have an impact. But if they do it for a long duration of time, say one, two, or three years, they can become an expert or a master thanks to the power of compounding growth. The problem is that we often underestimate the effects of compounding, and we overestimate the benefits of short-term gains or losses. We tend to focus on the immediate and visible outcomes, and we ignore the delayed and invisible ones. We also tend to be impatient and impulsive, and we want quick and easy results. The lesson here is that you should be patient and persistent with your financial goals and plans. You should start saving and investing as early as possible, and keep doing it for as long as possible. You should also avoid unnecessary fees, taxes, or losses that can reduce your returns. You should also be curious and ambitious with your personal growth and development. You should learn new things and improve your skills and habits every day. You should also avoid distractions, temptations, or mistakes that can hinder your progress. Alright, the fifth and final takeaway from the book is that pessimism is seductive and dangerous. What does that mean? It means that we tend to be more attracted and influenced by negative and fearful stories and scenarios than by positive and hopeful ones. It also means that we tend to be more cautious and conservative with our money and our actions than we need to be. For example, some people might think that the world is going to hell and that everything is doomed and hopeless. They might listen to the news or the media that constantly report on the problems and the crises that are happening around the globe. They might also read or watch the experts or the pundits that predict the worst outcomes and the worst scenarios for the future. Others might think that the market is going to crash and that everything is overvalued and risky. They might look at the charts or the data that show the volatility and the uncertainty of the prices and the returns. They might also follow or trust the analysts or the advisors that warn them of the dangers and the pitfalls of investing. The problem is that pessimism can lead to paralysis and inaction. It can make us miss out on opportunities and possibilities that can improve our lives and our finances. It can also make us unhappy and stressed, which can affect our health and our relationships. The lesson here is that you should be optimistic and realistic about your money and your future. You should acknowledge the challenges and the risks that exist, but you should also recognize the progress and the opportunities that are available. You should also question the sources and the motives of the information and the advice that you consume and not let them influence your decisions without your own judgment. You should also remember that history shows that things tend to get better over time and that human ingenuity and resilience can overcome any obstacle. Well, that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. And don't forget to check out the book The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel for more insights and stories on the psychology of money. And if you are interested for another great video summarizing tips to help you get started on your financial journey, I highly recommend The Simple Path to Wealth. You can find the link to my video summary in the link here. This book is all about building wealth the slow and steady way by investing in low-cost index funds. 
Collins argues that trying to beat the market is a fool's errand and that the best way to build wealth is to invest for the long term and let compound interest do its work. I really enjoyed this book. Collins is a great writer and he makes complex financial concepts easy to understand. He also has a lot of great advice on how to avoid common financial mistakes. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, stay smart, stay happy, and stay wealthy. This is Iggy from the Investing Iguana, signing off. Bye.